Hi, and welcome to Failureology, a podcast about engineering failures. I'm your host, Nicole. And I'm Brian, and we're both from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Thanks again to our Patreon subscribers. We really, really appreciate your support. For those of you that don't know, we have a Patreon where we have different episodes that don't quite make the cut for this program due to the length or just information. But for less than the cost of a hot and ready pizza, you can subscribe to our Patreon and have access to those. Are those hot and ready's good, Brian? They're hot and ready. Right. Before we kick this this episode off, though, I, I do want to do want to talk real quickly just about sound issues that we had in our last episode. Those were completely my fault. I left my laptop charger at work. I had to record on my desktop here at home. It makes a lot of fan noise. It created some issues for Nicole on the editing, and it sounded like I recorded it from a submarine. So we're sorry. You know, this podcast is is volunteer. We are doing this on our own time because we enjoy this. This is, the, you know, this is our hobby, but we don't always have an abundant amount of free time to go back and re-record things. In fact, we'd already recorded that episode twice because we had some technical difficulties on the first recording. By technical difficulties, Nicole means that I forgot to hit the record button. Yeah. And also on top of that, I'm not a sound engineer. I do all of our editing. I like to think I've come a really long way since where I started, but I am still learning. And so sometimes it's just a lot of trial and error. So I did the best that I could. But we have the charging cord for the laptop. We're back in business, and this episode should be back to where we were before. Fingers crossed. If it sounds really bad, just pretend that I was doing it from a submarine. I don't know if that would help. (laughs) On to engineering news. This week in engineering news, a 2D polymer. Chemical engineers at MIT, which I feel is not the first time that we've had MIT featured on the engineering news, they created a new material that is stronger than steel, lighter than plastic, and can be made in large quantities and can leap buildings in a single bound. Current polymer forms one-dimensional chains, but this new material can form two-dimensional sheets, which scientists previously thought was impossible. Polymers are chains of building blocks that grow by adding new molecules on their ends. The two-dimensional polymers grow in a sheet. This polymer product has a wide range of applications from cell phones to structures to things they haven't probably even thought of yet. The material's elastic modulus, or the amount of force required to deform it, is four to six times greater than bulletproof glass, so it's quite high for its deformation. The yield strength, or how much force it takes to break the material, is double what it is for steel. So we have an incredibly strong material that the MIT scientists have created. It's also impermeable to gases, which makes it an ideal material to provide a gas tight and watertight coating on various metals or structures. For example, a coating on a car or steel structure. I think there's also potential for a lot of applications in the explosion protection field or or areas dealing with gases under pressure, especially the amount of strength that it has and the deformation is, is quite high. So I think that has a lot of I mean, obviously that has this has a lot of potential applications. Yeah, I think explosion protection is definitely one they should look at. If you want to read more on 2D polymers, check with the links to sources on the webpage for this episode at failureology.ca. We're going to take this opportunity to plug our April Fool special about the movie Airplane, which is one of my favorite movies. It's a great documentary. It's more like a mockumentary, I think. It's a documentary. It's very factual. The special will only be available on our Patreon, so head on over there, support our show, check out this April Fool's episode, and it's going to be a lot of fun to put together. Nicole, last weekend, for the first time in her entire life, watched Airplane. True story. How did it go, Nicole? It was better than I thought. Because it's from 1980, there's always the potential that... I don't... There's no nostalgia when I watch it, because I'm watching it for the first time so many years later. So I wasn't really sure what to expect, but I I actually thought it was pretty good. I thought there was a lot of jokes that they hit that landed well. And the overall premise of the movie was also pretty funny. Uh, there's definitely some jokes I didn't get because I, I know that there's callbacks to other movies that I've never seen. So I didn't get all of those jokes. But anyways, we're going to talk a lot more about it on our April Fool's special on our Patreon. So please head on over there and support our show. For less than the cost of a hot and ready pizza.
Now on to this week's engineering failure, the second Narrows Bridge in Vancouver, British Columbia. This bridge was constructed at the second Narrows of the Burrard Inlet in Vancouver. The Lionsgate Bridge, which is the, the large bridge that you see that goes through Stanley Park and connects that to the north side of, of the Burrard Inlet, that's the bridge that you would take if you were driving from Vancouver to Whistler. This isn't that bridge. This is the bridge to the east of that, and it connects Vancouver to the North Shore. It was constructed next to the original bridge, which is now converted to a rail bridge. So this bridge was replaced in 1968. The original bridge was constructed in 1925, and it was the first bridge to connect Vancouver to the North Shore over the Narrows. I'm just going to pause here for a second. We got a lot of bridges going on. So we've got the new second Narrows Bridge, which is the bridge we're talking about today. We have the first Narrows or the Lionsgate Bridge, which is west of that, about eight kilometers. And then the bridge we're talking about today, it's it's been constructed parallel to an existing bridge that's now converted to a rail bridge. So that existing bridge that's now a rail bridge was constructed in 1925. And it was the very first bridge that connected Vancouver to the North Shore. That bridge had some problems though. It was hit by a number of ships. The freighter Urna hit it in 1927, the Norwich City in 1928, the Lossmer in 1930, and then in September 1930, the Pacific Gather got wedged under the bridge and ripped away the center span. That seems like a lot of ships hitting this bridge. Yeah, it had a, it had a rough go. So in 1933, the provincial government bought the bridge and after it was out of service for four years, they installed a lift section in the middle span so that they could raise that up and ships could pass underneath. That seems like a really good addition to this bridge. Yeah, yeah, you th yeah. Well, I mean, so to be in their defense, boats are a lot bigger than they used to be. I mean, let's take the Titanic, for example. It was the grandest ship ever made in 1911. When you look at the Titanic sitting beside modern day cruise ships, it's this tiny little baby boat. Right? So it's also the grandest Lego set that I've built. That's true. Brian built yeah, Brian built the the Titanic Lego set and he showed me and it's it's actually really cool. It comes apart and it's all layered, all the decks. It's actually really cool, except for it's how many pieces? Nine thousand and ninety pieces. It took a took a little bit of time to build. That's about eight hundred and fifty pieces beyond my attention span for, for Lego sets, I think. So the lift section is still there today. The rail bridge is still in place and it remains up at all times, except when a train is crossing over the bridge. The second Arrows bridge is a steel truss cantilever bridge and it was designed by Swan Wooster Engineering Company Limited. Construction, like Nicole mentioned, started in November 1957 and the bridge opened August 25th, 1960. At the time, it cost $15 million to build and tolls were charged until 1963 to help pay and offset the costs for building the bridge. It sounds like a steal of a deal. $15 million is not very much. That does sound like a really good deal. Like even in, even in $1960, that sounds like a pretty good deal. Yeah. I was randomly browsing uh, real estate listings for things that I definitely can't afford on the, uh, on the North Shore in Vancouver for, for one of the ferry terminals, and there are houses houses that cost more than 15 million dollars like back then you could get a whole bridge that's only i say only 142 million dollars today which i know is a lot of money but for a bridge that's really not that much money i feel like that's a pretty good deal yeah 142 million for a bridge yeah it's a very good deal a steal of a deal that is terrible and i love it <laughs> since it's a steel trust cantilever bridge it's not as funny if you have to explain it. I make terrible puns all the time. I'm fine explaining my puns. Although you made the pun in this case. Damn right I did. Yep. And this bridge is 1,292 meters long with a center span of 335 meters and a vertical clearance of 44 meters and is part of the Trans-Canada Highway or the, the number one highway here in Canada, which goes from coast to coast. 120,000 people drive over the bridge every day. Although that number might be down a little bit over the last couple of years due to COVID. It's a lot of people crossing that bridge every day. The bridge has four northern approach spans, which lead from a viaduct, a main cantilever section spanning 335 meters, and then it has two anchor spans of 140 meters. So you've got the approaches on each side, you've got the really long section on the north side, and on the south side, you've got two smaller spans. 
The spans were numbered 1 to 7 from the north to the south, and the piers were numbered 1 to 17, again, north to south. The numbering is mostly just important as we explain which piers were an issue so that you can kind of understand where they, where they were in relation to the bridge on the north and south shore. The bridge deck itself was about 25 meters wide, and it had the intention of carrying six lanes of traffic with two sidewalks. And the erection plan for this bridge called for two temporary piers, which are called false bents, numbered N4 and N5, and they were to support the cantilevered sections between Pier 14 and Pier 15. So what that means is that the span between the permanent piers 14 and 15 was too far to install all of that bridge in one lift or, or at one time, at least with the technology that they were using on this bridge in 1960. So what they did is they installed these false bents or temporary piers in between the permanent piers to allow them to build shorter spans cantilevered out until they got all the way across. And these false bents, they're, well, they're extremely important to the story. They're very important. They were designed by an engineer. They just weren't designed by the engineer of record who designed the bridge. And the engineer who designed them failed to review that design before they were constructed. I also want to mention false bents because I think that's a little bit of an interesting name. False bents comes from the term false work. False work is a temporary structure used during construction to support a more permanent structure as it's constructed and sufficiently advanced to support itself. So we've talked about different types of false work, I think, throughout various episodes in this this podcast. As I mentioned before, the span between piers 14 and 15 was just too long for them to build all of that in in one section and have it self-support. And so they built these these temporary supports. And that's kind of where everything went wrong. I think it's also really important to note, you know, when I started researching this collapse, I assumed that the section that failed was the 335 meter section, the long span, the main section across the inlet. But that's not the case. It was actually the section north of that long span that failed. So I think that's that was just really interesting because it wasn't what I thought it was going to be when I walked into this story. Yeah, I, I thought that it was also going to be the, the long span of this bridge that collapsed. But like Nicole said, it that wasn't the case. As Nicole mentioned, the bridge does collapse. And this happens at 3.40 p.m. Pacific time on June 17th, 1958, when a crane was stretching from the north side to join two cords of an unfinished arch. So the south end of span 5 collapses, followed by the south end of span 4. Span 5 happens first, and then it drops half a meter to two meters based off eyewitness accounts, pauses, then collapses into the water. The north end of span 5 that remained on Pier 14 was deflected to the south, which is what caused the south end of span 4, which was also supported by Pier 14, to collapse. The so beams at the base of false bent N4 collapsed to the north. So essentially what happened is spans 4 and 5 were both supported on Pier 14. And when span 5 collapsed, it deflected the pier itself to the south. And then therefore span 4 was no longer stable because its support is now deflected. And so that's what caused it to collapse. So span 4 was, was fine on its own, but because of the other section, it kind of created a domino effect. For about 20 to 30 minutes before the collapse of Span 5, the locomotive, trucks, and west bottom cords were in position and stationary on the deck. So there was lots of movement happening up top, um, but, you know, well, I'm going to get into this right now, but, but none of it really contributed to the collapse. So before we do get into what the cause was, I, I do want to talk about what the cause wasn't. I think this is interesting and, you know, also fairly systematic. I think not that I necessarily investigate bridge failures professionally, but if I were to, this is how I would do it. In an effort to figure out what the cause was, they started ruling out all of the things they thought it could be. That's kind of how I would approach it. Because there's there are definitely some things in certain types of failures that you would automatically look to as the cause for collapse. And so it's important to to rule those out as you start to learn more information. I also really enjoy the the process of data collection. So whenever I'm I don't necessarily investigate failures, but I do troubleshoot a lot of mechanical systems. And the first step is always tell me absolutely everything that you know about the system. What's it doing? When does that happen? When that happens, what else is going on? And I just, I talk to the operator and I just ask them a ton of questions so that I can try to figure out what's going on. And that's, 
really enjoyable. It's like being like a detective or something, but not really. It's it's so satisfying when you do all the troubleshooting <laughs> stuff or try to get to the bottom of stuff or figure out why something that isn't working, how to make it work. It is very satisfying. I completely agree with Nicole on that one. Very. So what wasn't the cause? What was not the cause? The design of the bridge itself was sound engineering practice, and it was similar to structures designed around the US and the UK. So the design of the bridge itself was found to not be contributing to the cause of the failure. There was also no sabotage, explosion, extreme wind, or earthquake that impacted the bridge. And the tides were normal, so there was no ship collision, which, as we know from before, was very, very common with the old bridge. I also think this one's important. So, you know, back in 1960, this wasn't necessarily front of brain. But today, when we see major collapses occur, sabotage or some type of terrorism attack is is definitely at the top of the list for what investigators are looking at. That's not to say that that's always the cause, but that's almost on a lot of the newer failures, newer structural failures we've looked at. Terrorism is definitely mentioned there as far as a or an item that was looked at as part of the investigation and ruled out, which is really sad when you think about it. But that's the world that we live in. The crane that was sitting on top of the bridge deck that was used to lift sections of the bridge into place was not defective, which is which is really, really good. So as as you'll remember, this is a cantilever bridge. And so as they're building it, they're placing sections longer and longer as they kind of move their way across. And so they they used a heavy crane to lift those sections into place. Some bridges use cranes. I would say that's probably one of the more common methods that I've seen, at least from the bridges we've talked about. But there's also the Quebec Bridge that we talked about in episode six. So that's a while back. They actually lifted their, well, their final section collapsed while it was being lifted, which was the second collapse of that bridge. Really interesting story. That one was actually lifted from a ship uh, underneath the bridge, which I also thought was interesting. So, you know, there's a few different ways to do it. Anyways, this bridge used a crane. It wasn't part of the collapse, not defective. Span 4, which was the second span to collapse, was not structurally weak or insatiable such that it could have led to the collapse of span 5. So span 4 was strictly a, a sacrificial span. It it Had span 5 not collapsed, span 4 would have been fine. There was no real reason for it to collapse other than span 5 knocked out its peer. Also, speaking of which, Pier 14, which supported both spans 4 and 5, was constructed in accordance with the design. So this pier was constructed properly. It wasn't an issue. It didn't cause the failure. Even span 5 itself was fine. There was no structural members that were overstressed during the erection process, and the critical members were reinforced as required. So one thing that I think that's important to note here is that when you're lifting a span into place, the requirements of that structure to support itself for the lift are different than the requirements for it to support itself once it's in its final position. And so a lot of times they'll design a span for its final position, taking into account how it gets put in that position, the lift portion. And then a lot of times they'll add additional reinforcement to specific members, specific structural members to make sure that they stay secure during the lift process. But in this case, you know, they they looked at all of that and all of that was done properly, or at least didn't contribute to this failure, which, I mean, is, it's, it's interesting, you know, looking at the Westgate Bridge that we covered in episode 22, that one, that one had a few other problems, but one of them was that they didn't really prepare the bridge sections well enough to be lifted into place. And so the, the bridge sections, the span sections, weren't self-supporting until they got the rest of the bridge structure finished. And that ultimately led to the collapse of that bridge. So that is definitely an important part of bridge construction, but not a contributing factor to this collapse. And lastly, the collapse was not due to careless or faulty workmanship on the part of the erection crew or the design, the construction of the spans, anything of that nature. So the design was good. The construction was good. The materials were good. The contractor was good. No issues with the permanent structure itself. So what could it have been? What caused this bridge to collapse? Brian. Remember those temporary piers that were installed to erect span five that we talked about a while ago? False bent N4 and N5? Well, it was N4. Elastic instability of the webs of the stringer beams of N4 grillage 
accentuated by the plywood packings between the beams and the omission of stiffeners and effective diaphragming in the grillage, this was caused by an error in the calculations. So what is grillage? So grillage is the stacking of beams in layers that are perpendicular to the layer above or below them. So let's say the bottom layer runs left, right. The next layer on top of that, those beams would run up, down. Then the third layer would run left, right again. Grillage beams are used to disperse heavy point loads from a superstructure to an acceptable ground bearing pressure. So essentially they're taking a really, really heavy point load and they're dispersing it to a larger area and they're using several stacking beams to do so. And then the diaphragm piece, it acts as bookends, which holds all of those beams in place. So essentially you have, you have this layer cake of perpendicularly placed beams that have bookends all holding them in place and that's supporting each of the false bents legs n4 and n5 the use of plywood above and below the upper tier of grillage beams was a contributory cause of the failure because of the absence of stiffeners and ineffective diaphragming the pressure on the plywood was 9240 kilopascals under the west leg of bent n4 for reference a car tire is around 240 kilopascals the pressure on the plywood was almost 40 times as much. For anyone that's ever even looked at plywood, it's essentially several layers of wood glued together. Stacked on top of each other. It is not designed to handle 9,000 kilopascals of pressure. And I am not a structural engineer, but it seems pretty obvious to me that using it as a sandwich piece in between beams that you're stacking on top of each other, it seems like a bad idea. It's not, it's not a strong material and you're in a wet area. Like this yeah. is a bridge. This just seems like not the best use of material. No. And, and one thing that I, we mentioned earlier was that the false bent engineer didn't review the design before it was constructed. And so I wonder if the plywood was supposed to be there or if it wasn't, um, I'm, I'm also not completely sure what should be used instead of plywood. So are the beams supposed to be sitting stacked on top of each other? Or is there supposed to be a material in between them, just a different material? But plywood seems like a poor choice. And I'm not qual I'm not even qualified to make that decision, but that seems like a bad idea. Yeah, it's a lot of pressure on plywood that shouldn't be subjected to that much pressure. Interestingly enough, though, the investigation determined what they believed to be the cause of the collapse submitted this to the contractor and engineer who both agreed without argument and they presented a final conclusion at the hearing rather than discussing and arguing findings at the hearing, which seems like a fairly cut and dry, straightforward, both parties accepted that this is exactly what happened, that the bents were improperly designed and so what normally would happen is that the investigation would occur, they would submit their findings, and then at the hearing which is what I imagine to be like, like what a court setting would look like, where both sides present their evidence for their case and argue the argue the potential findings in the report. And then they come with they come away with a conclusion that ideally all parties would agree on, but maybe a modified version from the initial, you know, the initial report that was proposed. In this case, though, they propose the conclusion before the hearing occurred and everyone just said, yeah, you're right. That's totally what happened here. And then, so when they went to the hearing, it was just a matter of, yes, we're all in agreement. This is the cause. One takeaway that I think is really important from this failure. So again, not structural, my discipline's mechanical, but I have had clients certainly over the course of my career decide partway through a repair that a temporary fix something that i thought was going to be there for one maybe three months would be permanent this is usually due to cost or schedule or really anything else i mean they're the client it's kind of up to them and so uh, sometimes it's even a matter of the permanent repair parts being delayed in delivery so instead of it being one month maybe it's six sometimes it's forever but why I think why I think this failure is important is because I, I think it's really important to mention that where possible and within reason, I design temporary measures to be permanent. So that way, if the if the plug gets pulled, I'm still covered and the design is still safe. And and you know this is a little bit different because 
these false bends were never intended to be permanent and they were they're literally their whole purpose is to be temporary so it's it's a little bit different but you know they they need to be designed and cared for and constructed in such a way that they could be permanent because you never really know how long they'll be there I feel like this is not the first time that bents have been used on a project like this. So I, I would think there would be some other previous designs for bents that they could have drawn on for a similar size project or weight project. Yeah. And, and you know, this this bridge, I mean, we've seen it before. This bridge could have gotten partway completed and then they ran out of money or it got put on hold or something else happened and they didn't finish construction of the bridge or maybe it sat for 20 years. So you never know how long these temporary spans or temporary measures or solutions or repairs are going to be in place. And I, I think it's really important to, I just pretend like they're going to be there forever because you don't really know what's going to happen and you can't guarantee that they're going to be removed in the time frame that you expect them to be. And yeah, sometimes that makes the temporary supports a little more costly. I think it's worth it if it's within reason. If it's not within reason and they're really, really expensive, then I think that's a discussion that needs to be had with the ownership group to say, okay, here are the risks, just so you're aware, you know, if, if these go in place and the time frame changes and they stay in place longer, these are the these are the risks and this is what could happen. And then that way they're at least making an informed decision. I, I think that's really important. So when the bridge collapsed, 79 workers fell 30 meters into the water. Most of the people that fell into the water died instantly. 18 workers were killed. This included 14 iron workers, a painter, and three engineers, one being the engineer of record for the bridge and one being the engineer for the false bends. Unfortunately, four other workers also died throughout the construction of this bridge. A diver also died searching for victims during their recovery. The bridge was eventually completed and it opened on August 25th, 1960, and in 1994, it was renamed the Iron Workers Memorial Second Narrows Crossing to honor those who died during construction of the bridge. Stomping Tom Connors even sang a song about the bridge called The Bridge Came Tumbling Down in 1972. So there you have it. Plywood in between and no bookends on stacks of beams led to the collapse of two spans of the Second Narrows Bridge and the loss of 18 lives. Even though they were temporary, it was imperative that the false bents be correctly designed to support the structure until the permanent piers are constructed. For photos, sources, and an episode summary from this week's episode, head to failurology.ca. If you're enjoying what you're hearing, please rate, review, and subscribe to Failurology so more people can find us. If you want to chat with us, our Twitter handle is at Failurology. You can email us at thefailurologypodcast at gmail.com. You can connect with us on LinkedIn or you can message us on our Patreon page. Check out the show notes for links to all of these. And tune in to the next episode where we'll talk about Piper Alpha. We're even going to have a special guest for this one, so that's really exciting. That'll be the first time that it's been more than just myself and Nicole on this podcast. Yeah, we're excited for that one. So check that out on the next episode. Bye, everyone. Talk soon. <laughs>